I'm here to talk to you about the state of the European game development industry. It's something macro level, so um, I'm not going to be just a talking and walking Wikipedia. Um, I'm going to talk about numbers in Europe. I'm going to talk about different games produced in Europe, but I'm also going to talk about some lessons to learn from our colleagues from different countries, which I think should apply to, uh, to the Bulgarian community. Um, to be more specific about what I'm going to talk about, um, I'm going to go through some numbers in the European market. I'm going to uh, also go um, in terms of Eastern Europe, country by country, so that I show you not only that you're not alone in this, but also that uh, a lot of great games are produced around Bulgaria, and not only. Um, I'm going to talk about uh, state aid, which probably at this point for you is not something very... Um, the, the, the connection between games and state aid is not very clear, but I'll show you that it's actually crucial for uh, sustainable development of a community. And uh, I'm going to show you that through some very um, s selected case studies. And then summarizing the, the lessons to learn. Uh, I'm obviously not going to talk about all the countries in Europe because we don't have time for that, but I'm going to uh, focus on some very good examples like Finland, like Poland, like Spain, Belarus, Ukraine, and obviously Romania, since I know most about. Uh, so let's go now to the European Union and the numbers behind it. Uh, there are around 3,000 studios at this point in the European Union and in Turkey. Um, actually, the Bulgarian students are not, uh, uh, studios are not included in this number, just because the European Game Federation didn't have numbers from your community. But uh, once you get your own association, you'll get those numbers straight, and they're going to be added here. Uh, and in terms of people employed in the industry in Europe, there are 45,000 people employed. So I have here um, the most important ones. As you can see, in terms of studios, UK and Poland are leading. And uh, I want to focus more on the people employed, because that's where Romania is on the podium as well. Um, 11, 11, that's 11,000 actually, <laughs> not 11 people, uh, 10,000 in Germany and 6,000 in, uh, in Romania. Uh, so after I found out the numbers in terms of studios and people, I wanted to um, go and research what type of games European studios actually make so that I share this information with you. And I actually find, uh, found out that when it comes to, to games, Europeans really, really, really like mobile games. So actually, 36% uh, of all the mobile games produced uh, in the world are uh, European-based. Um, in terms of where these games are played, so in terms of also where the, the money comes from, I tried to, to find out some interesting statistics. I couldn't. Uh, however, three days before this presentation, I read um, a study which actually showed me where we should be in terms of market and in terms of, of gamers. So apparently, the biggest market is China. Actually, a fellow speaker yesterday uh, mentioned that as well. There are 600 million gamers in China, and they actually spend around a quarter of all the money spent on uh, on games uh, worldwide. So that's around $25 billion in China. However, um, only 4% of all the iOS games in China are made in, uh, in Europe. So that's not quite a big uh, market penetration. However, it's not our fault. Uh, it's just because the Chinese gamers uh, are very, very fond of Chinese games. And actually, 93% of um, the games they play are Chinese. It's, uh, it's the most localized market. Um, however, uh, in terms of uh, money coming into Europe, uh, Asia is uh, also one of the, um, the, ones, the, the, the regions that invest a lot in, in our studios. Uh, talking about 
who invests in game studios in Europe, uh, I actually find, found out that uh, in terms of investment rounds, Asia uh, turns out to be uh, increasing as a strategic partner in European studios. However, it's not only the Asians that invest in Romania, not in only Romania, but in, uh, in Europe. It's also uh, the large media and entertainment companies all over the world who realize that they should add games to their entertainment portfolio, obviously taking into account it, be, it brings great money. And then another thing, another channel that um, at this point is, um, is relevant and needs to be mentioned is that studios that have been successful and big studios in, in Europe at this point go further into investing in smaller studios in their regions. So, for example, in Finland, Supercell is now investing in a studio called Shipyard Game Studio, uh, trying to, to making it big. So, it's not only the outsiders, the investors, who just think about the revenue that you get afterwards, or it's not only about um, other industries that come invest in our games, it's also within. So studios that help other studios, because they know that with a bigger market and a bigger industry, they also have something to profit from. Uh, in terms of investment, um, the issue was for many, many years that uh, investment, especially in Europe, was very scarce due to the fact that it's a very, very risky business. However, it is actually the most liquid market in terms of um, IT, IT markets uh, in, in the world. And this has, seen, uh, has been known for a couple of years now and investments start rising up and investments in Europe start rising up even more. So, Let's go now to Eastern Europe. I'll just, I'm just going to show you a bit of the markets in the different neighboring and almost neighboring countries around. I'll obviously start with the big numbers. So we have around 200 studios in Eastern Europe, meaning Bulgaria, Romania, Belarus, Ukraine, Serbia. And uh, these 200 studios actually employ around 10,000 employees. If you see 200 and then you see 10,000 employees, you kind of get to my third point here, which is there's a big concentration in terms of revenue and in terms of employees. So meaning that there are some very big studios who uh, employ a lot of people and also get a lot of the revenue that comes in in Europe. So I'll start with Romania because uh, that's what I know most of. Um, Romania is the, 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 the reason why 6,000 people are employed now in Romania is mostly because there's Ubisoft, there's Gameloft, and there's Electronic Arts having big studios in Romania. So thousands of people are employed by these three studios. However, um, these studios kind of breeded slowly increasing smaller studios that try to make it big on their own. Uh, I have here um, five different um, stu Romanian studios that are worth mentioning. So the first one is actually Ember. Uh, Ember doesn't produce its own games but offers high quality services for games and studios for the gaming industry and it actually employs around 300 people which is big for for our uh, for our industry and for independent um, studios then there's a typical game to do evolution a typical game it's actually uh, the company of kind of like a founding father of the industry in Romania Andrei Lopato uh, then there's Maven Hut who does a lot of money on uh, social well, social card games. Then there's Killhouse Games with Door Kickers. Um, a funny anecdote that I actually heard from my colleague Razvan last night is that uh, Door Kickers 1 was used in the Ukrainian army for, uh, <laughs> for um, practice and that got a lot of press. 
and that actually helped the, uh, the game a lot. Uh, we are going to present in the Romanian pavilion in uh, Gamescom this August uh, the launch of Dorothy Curse 2. And then there's uh, the browser game eRepublic, which is also um, quite, uh, quite uh, big in terms, in terms of revenue and in terms of gamers. Is there anyone here who knows any of these small studios? Anyone? Okay, three people. Yay. <laughs> so you do look uh, around. Okay, so this would, be, uh, this would be Romania in a nutshell. We go then uh, to Hungary. Hungary has um, Gameloft there, and it also has uh, Kilo Entertainment in terms of international studios who, um, who have a studio there. Uh, Kilo Entertainment are the ones with Subway Surfers. I'm sure that everyone knows them. Um, then some three of the most important Hungarian students, uh, uh, studios would be Neocore, Primal, and Nemesis with King Arthur, Supernova, and Pinball FX. Is there anyone who knows these? Or one of these? Okay, four, five. So you must, you actually know more about Hungary than Romania. You should get your uh, lid straight. Uh, then we go to Belarus, which is a very, very interesting um, industry, local industry. Um, first of all, it's very interesting because it's much more concentrated than even Romania, yes. Finally, uh, it actually has only 20 studios and it employs around 4,000 people. So that's quite a big concentration. Uh, and the reason is World of Tanks, actually Wargaming. So Wargaming employs uh, in, um, in Belarus more than 2,000 people and it slowly but surely kind of takes over all the studios around it. But there still are some that are still independent from it. And these independent ones, they create things like Rage of Mages, Toy Defense, and the series of Cradle of, like Cradle of Rome. Who knows anything except World of Tanks? OK, even more. Great, so apparently the, the Belarusian games are, uh, are famous here in Bulgaria. Okay, uh, I want to go over Belarus before actually mentioning Platikan. I didn't want to put it here just because I didn't want to um, focus on slot machine games, but it has to be mentioned, taking into account that Platika is actually uh, one of the few billion dollar European companies, gaming companies in at the moment. So. There are, I think, around six or seven billion dollar European studios, and Platika is one of them. Uh, then we go to Ukraine. Ukraine has Gameloft, has Ubisoft, has obviously Wargaming there, has Platika, and has Plarium, which, to be honest with you, I didn't manage to find out if it's Ukrainian or it's from Israel or where, where is it from. But uh, it's quite big. It employs around 600 uh, employees in Ukraine. And it has studios in like four different cities in Ukraine. OK, and uh, last but not least, uh, this is Serbia. Uh, Serbia is very interesting in the sense that uh, what I found out from uh, people who work there in um, in a Serbian studio is that many of the studios that are Serbian actually focus on hidden object puzzle adventure games. So that's quite interesting because in general you don't really find um, a concentration on a genre in, in different countries, but this is what happens in, um, in Serbia. There are many who are very uh, successful doing this type of games. There are many who actually start out by trying to do them, but then realize they can't do it and start doing other things. But still, HOPA is quite big in, uh, in Serbia. Uh, the bigger uh, and the most, uh, the, the, the studio that employs the most people is uh, Apex Entertainment. Has anyone heard of them? 
Okay, one person. So you don't really like uh, hidden object puzzle games, apparently, here in Bulgaria. Uh, Apex is actually the most productive developer of OPA games uh, in the world. Another thing that's uh, interesting of the Serbian market is that unlike most of the European or at least European, uh, Eastern European countries and industries, they are not, um, the concentration of studios is not in the capital city. So actually Apex, which is the biggest, and Medhead and some other ones are based in Novi Sad. So Novi Sad is the gaming capital of, uh, of Serbia. And um, now uh, Ubisoft has recently opened um, a small studio there. Okay. So finishing with um, some snapshot uh, ideas on the Eastern European market and some numbers in the European market, I want to go onwards talking about state aid. Um, it's not, it doesn't seem relevant at first, but actually for the industry that we're in, state aid is crucial for a sustainable development of an industry. Um, Canada shows it, South Korea shows it, and some great examples in Europe show it as well. The reason why it's so important is because there are um, a number of state measures, state aid measures, that can be very helpful for a risky business such as gaming. So there are tax breaks, there are soft loans, loan guarantees, support for export and trade missions, and last but not least, actually the most important one, are direct grants. Um, the reason why direct grants from the, pub, from the state are important in our industry is because investment doesn't come so easy. I told you uh, a while back that ga the gaming industry, although very liquid, is very risky as well. So in order for smaller studios to actually survive creating something, and in order for a smaller studio to try innovate in such a market as ours, direct grants from the state are very, very important. Okay, so I will go uh, with um, a, short, uh, a short table from the European Game Developers Federation which kind of shows the type of uh, state aid measures that happen in different European countries. As you can see, the most popular ones are grants and trade missions. Obviously grants, I told you why. Trade missions is also equally important just because funding going to a fair is quite expensive for many small studios. However, however expensive it is, it's also crucial for them. Because as you know, gaming is not a localized, necessarily localized market, right? You need to compete on, the, on a global scale. So that means you have to go where the gamers are, and that's everywhere. So trade missions are very important. Um, Knowing that these things happen actually helped us as Romanians just because we knew where to concentrate our efforts, right? So we had some um, income tax exemptions for our programmers um, in Romania, and this helped a lot, our gaming industry. However, we didn't see uh, at first the need to focus on cultural state aid measures, and it turns out that they are important, so we, um, at this point, started working on that with uh, uh, our uh, state institutions quite a lot. Uh, apart from cultural, because obviously games are... People who create games actually create culture. Another thing that's very important is that Creating games is also a source of R&D and a source of innovation. So many innovative things that at first started as different engines for games start uh, spilled over real life and helped everything from 
health to economics, right? Or gamification in terms of business processes. So R&D is also important, and obviously SMEs, which is something critical for smaller studios. Okay, so we go onwards to, to something that I thought uh, was, uh, was very interesting, that was said by uh, the vice president of EGDF, and he said that actually there's power in the diversity of state aid measures that happen around Europe, Obviously, this power is only important if you know about it and if you collaborate and if you uh, exchange ideas and share best practices with other countries. Uh, but it's actually um, a power that, if done right, can build groundbreaking public support instruments. So it's our job as communities in, and local communities in Europe to come together and create these groundbreaking public support instruments. Obviously, the downside is that uh, uh, regulations that are not very coherent uh, can be detrimental. So that's one of the arguments why you should be pro-European, at least in this case. <laughs> okay, so I'll go then um, to, to case studies. And before I do that, uh, I want you to um, just name a country in your head which you think is the poster child for, um, for state aid measures and the star child for state aid measures in Europe. So I hope you did that. And if you didn't say Poland, you were obviously wrong. Because Poland is actually something we should all look up to. Um, I'm not going to lie, the fact that it had the Witcher was very, very helpful. What we are trying to do, though, is, without having a witcher, create this, ty this type of state support. So a, a short snapshot of uh, the Polish industry, because I didn't have that in my first uh, part of the presentation. In, a year, uh, in three years, it actually grew in terms of studios with 90. So 90 new studios in three years. 90 studios is quite huge, taking into account that we don't even have 90 as a whole. So not, not just an increase, but the entire thing. In terms of people employed, the same. Such a huge, uh, a huge increase. But obviously, the biggest one is in terms of revenues. Uh, it's actually doubled in, in three years. So that's quite big. In terms of state support, Poland, um, there's, there's a reason why their star is in this. Um, Poland has a very, very tight private-public partnership for the gaming industry. They realize that the gaming industry is a great source of revenue, a great source of uh, employment, and so on. So they started with, uh, with a lot of measures that at this point, actually in 2016, um, summed up to this. So, 20 million euros in 2016 on R&D grants for the gaming industry, right? Uh, six to seven trade missions a year. We're actually super proud in Romania that this August we're going to do the first one with the public funding, but they do six or seven for like years. Uh, around 100k has been invested per each trade mission. Uh, by the Polish government, so that's quite big. And another interesting thing is the Startup Accelerator Grants for Venture Capital. Okay, so that was Poland. We go to Spain. I chose Spain because I wanted to show you how this industry can actually be an amazing jobs generator. You know that uh, as Poland was the poster child for state aid, Spain uh, until uh, recently was the poster child for unemployment and specifically youth unemployment and in this kind of bleak environment the industry the gaming industry actually grew and went beyond any expectations so it actually grew by 29% in 2013 and uh, also important that almost half of the employees are under 30 so talking about youth unemployment, not really in the gaming industry in Spain. 
okay, so after Spain, we go to, to Finland. Finland is another amazing, amazing example. Poland is amazing just because you didn't expect it, right? But Finland is also amazing in terms of state aid, but you kind of expect it because they're innovators in every kind of industry and also in education and so on. Finland actually is here to show you the power of, uh, of a strong and united community because the associations, the gaming associations in Finland, and also the big studios in Finland, like Neo Games, are instrumental in creating a great um, perception of the gaming industry in this country. So at this point, um, games are recognized as a form of culture, which is not something that in our countries uh, seems even fathomable, whatever. Um, and the fact that this is uh, recognized as such, it actually helped them a lot to um, have better state aid measures from the public sector, because the public sector has such a great opinion of the industry as a whole. And another thing that's very important when we talk about state aid, and not only about state aid, but about public-private partnerships in gaming, is uh, education. This is something, a very, very weak point for the European market, and especially for the Eastern European market, because we literally don't have enough or any game dev educational facilities or institutions in, in our country. And it's not only about having them as numbers, but it's also about having them as good quality institutions. And that's very important when we uh, discuss with our governments or with our public institutions. And they are the ones that can actually help us be, have a sustainable educational system in terms of our industry. So I hope it's clear, there are, there are clear reasons that uh, show you how state aid and how public-private partnerships are important for a growing sustainably local industry, and here in Bulgaria as well. Uh, in terms of Romania, so the, the things that we've learned from looking abroad, the things that we've learned from reading different literature, uh, are the things that we are trying for the past two years, Catalina and I, to implement in, in our industry and uh, help it grow. So we've done a lot of things. We've done uh, things to promote the industry for public authorities, for the public at large, and also, very important, to promote the local industry outside Romania. That's also very, very important. So what we've done is, for example, last year when we didn't have public funding for Gamescom, we actually went with some studios to Gamescom as a pavilion, as Romanian games, just so that we have this power in numbers. We also uh, are going this year with public funding. We also had um, a booth, a reboot, the, uh, one of the conferences that you should know about if you don't know about. It's in Dubrovnik in Croatia, and it's quite big and even bigger now that GDC Europe is no longer a thing. Um, and we went there as a point of information for our industry, so we wanted publishers, we wanted investors, we wanted different partners to know that the industry, the Romanian industry is a thing. There's a reason we're there. And the reasons, we explain them face to face, and that's what actually counts. So it's very, very important to promote your industry abroad, not only studio per studio, but also the entire industry, because it can be a great... Um, a great help when you talk to somebody, uh, somebody from an international, with an international perspective. Uh, apart from promoting it uh, outside the country, we also tried to um, to promote it towards our what what we actually need. So that's human resources, and we did that through a national university contest. It was Game Cup 1.0. Uh, it actually had the final two months ago. Uh, we had 
around 60, 70 uh, teams that uh, got involved. We mentored 40 of these teams. We had studios from RGDA, from the big ones like Ubisoft, to smaller ones which have three people in the studio, but still were mentoring teams of university students so that they help them out and show them how you create a good game. And then we had, a, a, obviously, a national contest with members of the jury, with great prizes and so on, which helped the next generation of game developers know more about this industry. It wasn't only polytechnics, it wasn't only IT, it was also uh, art, universities and so on. Because that's another problem of the industry, you need to to go to the artists as well, you need a lot more artists than you have now to be sustainable, right? In terms of public-private partnerships, we're new to this, but um, we, we actually started uh, quite uh, with a big, uh, big uh, hit this year. We met the Ministry of Small and Medium-Sized um, Companies and of Commerce. We showed him how the industry looks like, and he was actually completely shocked and puzzled. He was like, so where have you been till now? Why haven't you told us? Why don't we know that you're so many, that you do so great, such great things, and that you actually create so many things? And we were humble in knowing that we should have done this years ago, but we didn't now, and we're not going to stop. And after the meeting with the ministry, we actually got included in a memorandum on creative industries in Romania. This memorandum is actually, it creates a legal system where we will go and work together with the public institutions to create the state aid measures that we need for our industry. So that's quite a, a big thing that we're pretty proud of. And last but not least, um, Catalin's idea of creating a conference for uh, the local community got bigger, larger, and will get much better this year in, uh, in September. It's our conference, Dev Play. Um, we needed to make sure that people know the importance of a community, the importance of gathering, networking, talking about different things, not only listening to these lectures, because Obviously, you'll extract like two, three things from mine, from the others, and so on. But the importance is that you meet each other, that you talk over a coffee, over a beer later, or so on, and that you exchange opinions. And we really were passionate about this idea, so that's why we created the play. And I think it was um, a great success last year. It will be much better this year. Uh, it's important, it's important to, to have this kind of meetups, and that's why I salute Martin and Heliana for creating this Game Dev Summit, and I hope it will happen every year and it will be bigger every year, just because it's very important for, for you all and for growing the community. Okay, so now that uh, I've, I'm done with the case studies, I want to sum it up and finish it all. And uh, there are two lessons I wanted to, um, for you to, to go um, to lunch with. Um, and they can be actually summarized in one thing. Um, Heliana took us two days ago uh, to walk around the, the, the center of the city and we saw the parliament and apparently um, what says on your parliament is actually the most relevant thing for my talk today and for what needs to, needs to get stuck in your heads. And that is, um, it's written power in unity or unity in power, something like that. And that's the most important thing that you have to take on. There's, there's power in numbers, but if they're not united, it's not so much powerful. So the first thing is that you as a community need to promote your industry outside your country. Um, the reason being that if you get a recognition at an international level, then through more international partners, you're, you'll have an accelerated development. The reason why you need to be strong as a community and you need the international community to know about you as an industry, as a local industry, is because it can also be your CV. If you're a small studio, 
going to talk to international companies, they, it might help when you say you're Bulgarian, because they might know that they had some Bulgarian partners that were very helpful, or they might know that the Bulgarian industry is serious in this business, right? So having a, a good recognition and having a good image international will help each and one of you. However, even if it helps each and, each and one of you, it takes each and one of you, oh, that's so hard, uh, to actually create it. So put your country on the map, that's very important. And when I say that, it means actually this. So you go to GDC, you go to uh, obviously Gamescom or different kind of uh, affairs and conferences, and you have your own country pavilion. That's quite important. For example, for um, the years before uh, Catalina and I joined the RGDA, uh, I remember the, the, the girl who was taking care of Köln Messe, which is the partner that uh, creates uh, Gamescom. She was telling me, I've tried every year for you to come with a pavilion because it's so important. There's everyone, everyone in Europe there with a pavilion. And Romania, who has 6,000 people employed and who has such big names and such big studios and so on, they're... Um, it's not, it's not there, so it's so important for you to be there. And we finally went there, very small, last year, and we are going to, to go with the bank this year. So quite important for, for you to, to know this. It, it makes a bigger impact rather than going as an uh, indie in a million other indies in, uh, in Gamescom, if you go together as a, as a community. It's also, it feels safer, right, as well. Uh, and the second one is promote your industry at state level. So there has to be public awareness and public perception, and the public perception of your industry in your country needs to be um, a good one and needs to be a, a big one, right? Uh, because that's how you actually get the the public institutions interested in your, in your industry. And they will help out because they know that your revenues will bring them money as well and that your successes will help them as well. You just have to show them that. And obviously, when we first started and we first thought of it, we thought, okay, we're just not so big. I mean, IT is so big in Romania, or at least I thought. IT is so big in Romania. I mean, the industry, the gaming industry is not, such a big thing. But then we started counting. We started counting studios, we started counting people, we started counting revenue, and we realized we were not as small as we looked. And I'm uh, hoping that you're going to do the same, and I'm hoping that you're going to also find out some numbers that will surprise you. And last but not least, it's not only about what you have at this point. It's also about the potential that there is in this industry. And you have to also show them the potential of it all. So don't only say about the revenue that you bring into this country now. Tell them about the success stories in other countries and about how important and how big the industries are in other countries. I, I can barely speak at this point. <laughs> okay, so this should be the... the the most important things that I want you to, to go home with. And now that uh, I hope I said anything or something that might uh, interest you, uh, I hope you'll allow me a small commercial announcement. <laughs> uh, it's, uh, it's about DevPlay. It's about our conference in, uh, in September. It has uh, around 70% international speakers, right, Catalina? Uh, people from Bandai Namco America to some Finnish guy in a big studio and so on. Uh, it has a great line of speakers, but it's not only that. It's about the networking opportunities. It's about the fact that we'll have speakers also from the, the region around us. So we hope to have some good Bulgarian ones, Serbian, and so on. And we hope to bring communities from Eastern Europe together, just because I think it's comforting to know that, you're, that there's many of you 
that actually, as an industry, you are connected to each other and you have to share different things that might help you develop your, your, um, your businesses further. And I'll end with saying just one thing. Uh, don't treat gaming just as a passion, because it's not only a passion, it's actually a very lucrative business. You have to treat it like one. And that means uh, going outside your studio, going outside your bugs that you need to fix, talking to other people, talking to your local community, most importantly. And after that, when you unite yourself as a community, talk and be uh, aware of what happens in the region close to you. And that's that. Thank you.